Okay, in this video, we're going to discuss kind of a really gross oversimplification of HIV and the effects on the immune system. Um, I'm going to make more videos on HIV kind of throughout, um, but we need to discuss it now. One, because um, for my students, the case that we're discussing, the patient has an HIV co-infection. And this is a good method for me to kind of introduce the idea of HIV, how it works. Um, and also in a single pass curriculum, HIV serves as a way to remind us of how the immune response normally should work and what happens when we lose portions of the immune system. So HIV is an enveloped RNA virus. Um, there are 36.7 million infected people in the world as of 2016, and 1.8 million of them became newly infected that year. Um, it's something that infects almost everybody. Um, heterosexual and men who have sex with men are prominent routes of transmission, but obviously blood and other tissues um, also harbor the virus. Um, and disease, if you see it, is going to present as an acquired secondary immunodeficiency um, unless patients get tested, which is becoming more common. So let's talk a little bit about kind of its main structures. So like I said, it's an enveloped virus. Um, HIV env, that's one of the proteins, can also be used as kind of a um, method of detecting the virus, although the majority of the envelope obviously is acquired from host cell membrane when it leaves infected cells. There are two linked surface glycoproteins that are viral proteins that the virus uses to enter the cells, and that's GP120, um, which binds to CD4 and either CCR5 or CXCR4 as co-receptors, and then GP41 actually allows for viral fusion, not entry. Um, CXCR4 is more often associated with T-cell infection, whereas CCR5 is more often associated with macrophage infection. But both of those act as co-receptors. Um, I don't require you to know very many viral replication cycles, but HIV is one of them. Um, we're going to talk about it a lot um, throughout the course of two years because we're going to talk about the drugs that can be used to treat HIV, um, and certainly understanding the viral replication cycle will make it a lot easier for you to understand the um, how the drugs work, the mechanism of action of the drug. So the first thing to know is that the genome actually consists of two identical copies of RNA. And the RNA is protected by a capsid, which is made of a protein subunit called P24. And P24 is another one of those HIV proteins that we can use kind of diagnostically um, as needed. Okay, so how does the actual infection work? Well, first off, the virion is going to bind via GP120 to CD4 and a co-receptor, either CCR5 or CXCR4 on the same cell, so that the virus can use the two receptors or co-receptors on the target cell. Then virus entry is going to happen. So first you've got fusion, and you can note that GP120 and GP41 can often be left on the surface of the cell from which the virus has fused to, which is over here, okay? All right, at that point, you're going to have reverse transcription. It's going to occur in the cytoplasm. This is an RNA virus. And the reverse transcription is basically going to be the activity of the reverse transcriptase. The reverse transcriptase is incredibly important in HIV, and it is the target of a lot of drugs that are used to treat HIV. Um, it's also the target of drugs that are used to treat HBV, and that's why there's some cross-reactivity between the two. Um, but this reverse transcription is going to occur in the cell cytoplasm, and it's going to make a cDNA copy of the viral RNA genome. Then we have HIV integration. So the HIV DNA occurs integration occurs when the newly made viral DNA migrates into the cell nucleus and becomes incorporated into the host cell genome using virus encoded integrase enzyme. The integrated viral DNA is actually called a provirus. And this is actually what's so dangerous um, for patients is that this integration means that as long as this cell is alive, whether it's actively pumping out um, 
virions or not, it harbors the DNA. So for patients that go off their medication, the provirus could have been hanging out in the host genome within the cell, and then they go off their medication and now the provirus can replicate again. Um, but let's say this is gonna complete its viral replication cycle. Vir viral proteins are newly made actually in the cytoplasm still. So this is kind of, we're going back out to the cytoplasm here and you've got your viral proteins and that happens after transcription of the viral mRNA and its migration out of the nucleus, okay? So now we've made our viral proteins and we're kind of going to develop this core structure. The core structure is then put back into kind of an envelope that has GP120 and GP41 tagged on it on the cell surface membrane. And that buds out a new virion, which then can be sent out. Um, completed viral infection can actually lyse the cell and kill it. So it can bud out or it can actually lyse the cell and be um, cytopathic that way. Okay, so what does this actually mean as far as the patient? Well, how? first off, how do we get infected? So first off, when we're thinking about infection with virus, we need to think about how it's going to get everywhere. So when, it, when an individual is infected, through either sexual transmission or blood supply, we need to think about the first targets. And the first targets are actually probably going to be macrophages because there are a lot more macrophages in our tissue mucosal sites than there are T cells. But there's gonna be other cells as well that can pick up the virus. And either way, the virus is going to travel to the local lymph nodes where it's going to infect other cells and also spread throughout the lymph node. Um, and there's a high availability of HIV target cells in lymphoid tissues, which really supports the high levels of viral replication that we see in most patients very early on in infection. You can just see how it peaks very quickly. Um, we're gonna find this in pretty much all the lymph nodes, particularly the gastrointestinal um, tract associated lymphoid tissue, as well as I didn't have it here, but the malt mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, um, which are just gonna become seeded with the HIV. And remember, the seeding is also at the proviral DNA level. Um, without treatment, you're going to get two to three logs more of infected cells in the lymphoid tissue than you can actually detect in the peripheral blood. So think about that. Anytime you see a viral load in somebody's peripheral blood, so much more, it's like an iceberg, so much more is actually being harbored in the lymphoid tissue than what we're seeing. The next thing that happens is memory cells. So memory cells are going to become depleted at these sites of local proliferation. Um, most infected individuals can mount a pretty decent anti-HIV immune response that's both humoral and cell mediated. But despite that, all untreated HIV infected individuals will actually um, go on to, um, will actually go on to develop obviously chronic HIV, which leads to AIDS. So what happens here is this profound immunodeficiency that is a result of the depletion of CD4 T cells. So we're first going to talk about the different stages of HIV infection. You have acute infection, clinical latency, and AIDS. So acute infection actually spans weeks. Um, patients might experience mild to severe flu-like symptoms, but not everybody does. Um, and it's nonspecific, uh, fever, myalgia, fatigue. Some patients associate it as being the worst flu they ever had in their lives. Other patients say, well, I think I had a cold a couple of weeks ago. And all that is is your immune response attempting um, futilely to uh, fight off the HIV infection. But typically in this, at this point, sometime in these first couple of weeks, you're going to see the peak viral load in the blood. Um, it's going to get very high and you're going to see a very significant drop in CD4 T cell number um, that'll peak somewhere around two to six weeks post-infection. Then something interesting happens. We hit what's called the viral set point, which is actually pretty low, and the CD4 cells recover for a time. And this is largely the work, obviously, of CD8 cells and K cells that are actually combating the infection, some neutralizing antibody as well. So we get this kind of return to normalcy, and that can last for as long as 10 years. And during this time, things look pretty normal. The viral set point is low, the CD4 count is relatively normal, and you wouldn't necessarily be looking for anything. Um, 
Then what happens eventually is that if the patient does not go on treatment, the CD4 count slowly falls. And as the CD4 count falls, clinical latency ends, and the patient is more susceptible to opportunistic infections, which are infections that don't normally occur in healthy individuals. And we see this as a result of the dropping CD4 count. Um, typically, anybody with a CD4 count less than 200, we're pretty concerned about. And we also start to see other physiologic problems, such as wasting disease and dementia. Um, and at this point, also viral levels will start to grow as the immune response becomes even more and more dysregulated. Now, if a patient remains on their antiretroviral uh, therapy, this can actually extend quite far. We've actually made so much progress in HIV treatment. Um, these days, the average life expectancy of somebody who takes their antiretroviral therapy um, religiously and is a well-controlled patient is almost equivalent to that of someone who is not HIV infected. Um, so there is hope for these patients, um, but obviously antiretroviral therapy would have to be continued. Now, the question is, why do we see this? Why at the end does 200 CD4 positive T cells lead to a significant increase in viral replication and obviously the opportunistic infections that are so damaging to patients? So that's this but why, but let's talk about that a little bit more. Well, first off, let's talk about the normal immune responses that are made to the virus. So when the virus first seeds, it's going to seed reservoir sites. So these are places where the virus is integrated into the DNA, but it's not actually replicating. Um, and that's going to stay completely. But there's also going to be virions that are replicating, and we make a variety of immune responses to that. So the first one would be the humoral response, which let's look at that over here. In most people infected with HIV, the virus rapidly establishes this persistent infection that escapes antibody responses in the host. And antibodies that bind HIV proteins, including like GP120, um, anti-P24, GP41, are present in the plasma later in infection. But these early antibodies are largely not neutralizing and they don't really protect against it. And you can see there's quite the window here. Um, so if we look at the CTLs, the CTLs don't show up till about six to nine weeks. They're going to peak and then they're going to come down. And that's actually, they're coming down as a result of the low viral set point. Because if you look at the plasma particles of virus, that peaks early, comes down, and then here's your low viral set point. So there's not a lot of virus here to prime these CTLs coming up, okay? Now, if we look at anti-envelope antibody, that is eventually going to show up, as is anti-P24, but look how long we're waiting before we can even detect it. What, nine, ten weeks? So several months before we're actually seeing detectable antibody in the blood here. And any immune response is going to be the same as it's been for any other infection. So you're going to create antibodies. You're going to create HIV-specific CD4-positive T cells. You're going to create HIV-specific CD8-positive T cells. And you're also going to promote the innate immune response through macrophages and NK cells and other organisms. And here's why that's actual, or not organisms, methods. But here's why that's not actually a good thing. In this case, the immune response is also the target. And that's what's going to lead to the dysfunction in the long run. Um, and this is what I really wanted students to get out of the activity on Friday. CD4 positive T cells are kind of the master regulators of the immune response. They have a lot of jobs. They provide cytokines, which promote CD8 positive T cells. They provide class switch signals and cytokines to B cells. They provide cytokines to natural killer cells like IL-12. They provide a killing cytokine to allow macrophages to kill and interferon gamma. Um, interferon gamma, IL-2 and IL-12 for CD8s, IL-2 for B cells. So they have kind of a big job. So if we knock out them, we kind of systematically knock out everything else, right? So we immediately knock out B cells because we're not getting the kind of T cell help that we need to create those antibodies that might help neutralize the HIV infection. We knock out macrophages because we're no longer making a lot of interferon gamma, which is going to help prime the macrophage response. 
we knock out NK cells because we're no longer making IL-12, which NK cells need to be licensed to kill. And we also knock out CD8s for the same reason. We lack IL-2, and that'll also be a problem for them moving forward. So what does that mean for patients in the long run? Well, one of the questions I asked in the activity was whether or not HIV-infected patients can receive vaccines. So our patient, Mickey Eakins, he had a CD4 count of above 350, an undetectable viral load. He was on a good antiretroviral regimen, and he appeared stable. In his case, he can receive vaccines, even live attenuated vaccines. And you can think of this as kind of a lesser of two evils. Would you rather experience an attenuated version of VZV when you know you have CD4 T cells on board, or would you like to be surprised by VZV as your T cells sink below 200? I think you'd rather have it while you still have CD4s. So as long as their CD4 count is good and the viral load is undetectable, it's okay to give them vaccines. Now, because we have that seeded reservoir and because anytime we lay off the pressure, the immune response is going to be engaged and that's going to help deplete the immune response even further, going off medication is dangerous. You're going to have strains grow out of the reservoirs and you're going to further damage the potential of the immune response. And immunopathogenesis is a real part of how the viral infection leads to immunodeficiency. And this happens through direct and indirect methods. So directly, HIV is cytopathic to CD4 positive T cells. So just a cell getting infected is enough to deplete it. But there are also immune mediated effects like opsonization, ADCC, or death by CTLs and NKs. And these are all ways that an HIV infected CD4 positive T cells could be killed. Um, they also die by apoptosis occasionally. And then as the immune response becomes more and more um, dysregulated, we see indirect effects, like we lack IL-2. And when we lack IL-2, we're not going to grow CD4 T cells. Also, the CD8 T cells are going to start expressing very high levels of exhaustion and energy markers like PD-1 and CTLA-4, indicating that even though they're present, they're not doing anything. That's all I have on HIV for now.